Hello everyone, uh, I'm astronaut Charlie Duke. I was lunar module pilot on Apollo 16 uh, in 1972. Okay, let me take a picture for you, Charlie. Where at? How much? Uh, that's okay. After 50 years of silence, Apollo astronaut Charles Duke finally reveals what he truly saw on the moon. And it's nothing like you imagine. Honey base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket twin. Tranquility, we can At 89, Apollo 16 astronaut Charles Duke is breaking his silence, sharing the shocking truth NASA's cameras could never capture. You probably know the voice. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. That was Charlie Duke, the Capcom during Apollo 11, the calm, grounded voice speaking to Armstrong and Aldrin as they touched the moon for the very first time. He wasn't on the lunar surface then, but his voice was. Every astronaut, every mission control engineer, and every kid watching at home heard him, the man guiding legends from a small console in Houston. Duke became famous before he left Earth, yet inside he felt invisible. Imagine that, being the voice of history, yet watching it unfold from a chair. Charlie Duke had to be sharp, calm, and perfectly composed, even when his heart was pounding with envy and longing. As the Capcom for Apollo 11, he listened to every heartbeat of that mission, every static-filled word, knowing the whole world was tuned in. He was the calm between chaos, a man grounded by duty but burning inside with the same dream every astronaut shared, to set foot on the moon himself one day. As Capcom, Duke carried a level of pressure most people couldn't imagine. Every phrase, every syllable had to be precise. A single misunderstanding or slip in tone could have thrown the mission into confusion. Yet he handled it all flawlessly, professional, measured, and unshakable. Behind that voice of control, though, was an ache few ever noticed. Because while others were becoming legends on the lunar surface, Duke was still earthbound, his own dream orbiting just out of reach. It was a performance so perfect that no one realized how much it cost him emotionally. Years later, when he finally got his own mission, Apollo 16, everything came full circle. He wasn't just the voice anymore, he was part of the story he once narrated. But that transformation wasn't simple. It was tangled with gratitude, pressure, and ghosts of the past. The man who once guided others to the moon was now guiding himself, haunted by memories of what it meant to speak history without living it. Even in his spacesuit, he carried that dual identity, part dreamer, part witness, as if two versions of him existed in parallel, one speaking from Earth, the other walking in silence across another world. Something is haunting about that contrast. The grounded man who once connected others to the moon is now becoming part of that same story. It shaped him in ways few could understand. He later admitted that those moments as Capcom gave him a strange connection, almost a spiritual tether, to the moon before he ever saw it with his own eyes. It was like deja vu across time and distance. So when he finally landed, he wasn't just stepping into space. He was stepping into a conversation he had already started years ago, one between himself and the silence of the lunar world. And here's where it gets even more fascinating. When the Apollo 16 lunar module landed on Descartes Highlands, Charlie Duke finally lived the dream. But what he saw wasn't what the world had been told to expect. He described the moment like this. The blackness above wasn't a sky. It was an abyss so deep, it felt like falling into nothing. No stars, no blue shimmer, just a crushing emptiness that made you feel utterly alone. The contrast was brutal, pure light where the sun hit and pitch darkness everywhere else. Duke later said photos never captured that violence. The cameras flattened everything, turning something raw and terrifying into a postcard. And here's the part that surprises most people. From their landing site, the crew couldn't even see Earth. No glowing blue marble hanging in the distance. No Earthrise moment that documentaries love to replay. That scene, the poetic vision of Earth floating in lunar darkness, didn't exist for Duke. He said it was one of the most disappointing realizations of his life. For him, the moon wasn't peaceful or pretty. It was alien, a desert where silence was louder than any storm. He once reflected, the moon wasn't beautiful in a comfortable way. It was beautiful in a terrifying way. The horizon felt too close, like being trapped inside a bowl of light and shadow. The ground crunched like glass underfoot. 
Even his own heartbeat seemed amplified in that stillness. And yet, he couldn't look away. That haunting beauty stayed with him forever. What would you have done there? Stared into that darkness or tried to look away? Because for Charlie Duke, that moment redefined what exploration meant. It wasn't about conquering space. It was about facing the void and realizing how small and fragile we really are. Just when it seemed like the dream had finally come true, reality hit hard. Inside that bulky white suit, Charles Duke wasn't the fearless explorer people imagined. He was trapped inside what he later described as a fishbowl. The helmet's visor curved his vision, narrowing everything into a bubble. Turning his head felt impossible. If he wanted to look sideways, he had to twist his entire torso. He said the first few steps felt like walking underwater, except there was no resistance, only confusion. One-sixth gravity sounded romantic from Earth, but living it was chaos in slow motion. Every step sent him floating, bouncing and tipping over as he tried to regain control. He laughed through the first stumbles, realizing how ungraceful space could make even the best trained astronaut. But that laughter quickly faded into awe because he was standing on a world no human had ever truly understood until that moment. And all around him, nothing. No breeze brushes his suit, no echo of his movements. The silence was so profound that it seemed to have a life of its own. Inside the patient's body, the rhythmic hiss of oxygen and the hum of his life support system were the only sounds. Can you envision a situation where the breathing of a person is the loudest noise in the whole area? It was not quiet in a meditative way, but in an unsettling way, like being in the universe's heart and yet being completely isolated. Since he was a little boy, he had eagerly waited for this moment, making lunar maps and contemplatively looking at the stars. But now the situation has turned out to be really hard to take. The moon was not a cozy and silvery place. Rather, it was cruel, strange, and unbearably bright. The sunlight was cutting like a knife on the surface of the moon, and the gray dust was reflecting the light with such brightness that it was blinding. Life, uh, uh, I believe uh, that the, uh, there are, uh, God showed me. There was no middle tone, no softness, no warmth. The moon, he realized, wasn't just another barren land. It was a place that didn't care if he was there or not. He later said, you don't conquer the moon, you survive it, and that became his mission, to show people the truth, not the Hollywood version. Because back on Earth, people saw astronauts as superheroes on a clean, glowing surface. But up there, inside that helmet, Duke understood something deeper. The moon wasn't built for humans. Every breath, every heartbeat was a defiance of nature itself. That perspective, raw, unforgiving, and humbling, stayed with him forever. And here's where it gets criminally underrated. And it had a, a set compute cycle, so it uh, it went through, it queued up the job. While Apollo 11 made headlines and Apollo 13 became a movie, Apollo 16 quietly delivered some of NASA's biggest scientific wins, ones most people have never even heard about. First, Duke and John Young set up the first telescope on the moon. It captured ultraviolet light that Earth's atmosphere blocks, giving scientists a clear cosmic view no human eye had ever seen before. Over 71 hours, they covered nearly 16 miles using the lunar rover, collecting 209 pounds of rock and soil samples, some of which are still being studied today. Those samples revealed wild variations in composition, suggesting the moon wasn't formed the way we once believed. Then came the spectrometers, X-ray and gamma-ray devices that mapped the moon's chemical makeup. They uncovered patterns of iron, titanium, and magnesium that helped rewrite theories about how the moon came to exist. For geologists and space scientists, Apollo 16 was a gold mine. But for the public, it barely made a whisper because there were no first steps to celebrate, no life or death emergencies to dramatize. And yet Duke made sure to bring a little humanity to that sterile world. During one break, he decided to try something playful, a high jump in low gravity. He called it the Lunar Olympics, it looked fun until he nearly fell backward, risking a cracked helmet and certain death. Even in that split second of panic, he laughed, because that's what humans do. They find humor, even in danger. Still, the lack of recognition haunted him. He once said, 
People remember Apollo 11 for the first step, Apollo 13 for the problem. Nobody remembers Apollo 16 for what we discovered. But the truth is, his mission wasn't about fame anymore. It was about honesty, showing the moon as it really was, beautiful, brutal, and beyond imagination. And here's where Duke's mission took a completely different turn. Well, not on the moon, but back here on Earth. Because after all those miles, all those steps, and all those sleepless nights, he had to fight a new kind of battle against people who said it never even happened. You've probably seen it. The internet threads, the documentaries, the self-proclaimed truth seekers yelling. It was all filmed in a studio. But when they confronted Charles Duke, he didn't shout. He didn't argue. He just looked them in the eye and said, Sir, I was there. That moment went viral. His tone wasn't angry. It was tired. You could feel the weight of every hour he spent in that suit, every bruise, every risk. To him, the denial of Apollo was not simply a lack of knowledge, but an insult as well. An affront not only to the technicians who designed and constructed those rockets, but also to the astronauts who were put in danger and to the families sitting at home in fear during the whole process. Thus, Duke commenced to loudmouth, not for the sake of winning debates, but for the sake of safeguarding the truth. He talked about the lunar dust, which refused to fall off like static cling, and how they detected a slight smell of gunpowder when the dust was brought into the module. He depicted the temperature that made one side of his suit hot while the other was cold and dark. He mentioned the spooky silence, devoid of echo and sound, just his breath bouncing off the helmet, and his strongest argument, the rocks. NASA still has more than 800 pounds of lunar rock and soil in the laboratories, they are the subject of constant research, testing, and verification. Each of them has microscopic characteristics that are unique to the Earth and cannot be reproduced in any way. Few people in history can speak with the authority Duke has. He was both the voice that guided Apollo 11 and the man who walked on the moon himself. That combination doesn't exist elsewhere. Now in his late 80s, Duke uses podcasts, museum talks, and educational interviews to defend the legacy of Apollo not for glory, but for truth. His goal is simple, to leave behind a living testimony that outlasts every conspiracy, every false claim, every doubt. As he puts it, we didn't fake history, we made it. But here's the part that hits the hardest, time is running out. Of the 12 men who walked on the moon, only four are still alive. Charles Duke knows it. Every time he looks at an old mission photo, he sees more faces that are gone. So now his new mission isn't exploration, it's preservation. He spends his days talking to schools, appearing in interviews and visiting museums, not for fame, but to make sure history doesn't fade into myth. Because that's what scares him the most, that one day people will stop believing the moon landings were real simply because no one remembers them firsthand. He says, if we forget Apollo, we forget what we're capable of. Duke often speaks about NASA's Artemis program the next generation preparing to return to the moon. He calls it the bridge to Mars, a continuation of everything Apollo started. And you can see the spark in his eyes when he talks about it. That same curiosity that carried him across a lunar plane half a century ago. For him, the moon was never the finish line. It was the proving ground. He dreams that his grandchildren will live in a world where people walk on Mars. Not because it's easy, but because the human spirit refuses to stop exploring. And when asked what message he wants to leave behind, he said something simple but powerful. Apollo wasn't mythology. It was men, rockets, and risk. Every scar, every mistake, every miracle, all real. Now, as the last few moonwalkers share their stories, Duke believes that their legacy will light the path for humanity's next leap. One that could reach far beyond the moon. Because to him, truth is not just history, it's destiny. Charles Duke's story reminds us that the moon was never the end. It was the beginning. But now the question remains, should we return to finish what Apollo started or aim higher for Mars? Drop your thoughts below 